Adventure. Tonight, Ron Evans takes us back to the First World War in his story called Another Kind of Courage. The ugly trenches of the First World War scarred the March countryside of France as far as the eye could see. Heavy rains had turned the earthworks into dark, clinging mud, and the war-weary soldiers who manned them had become more like dull, unthinking robots. There was no glamour here, no bands and parades. Even heroism was rarely recognised, and that was because most of the combatants were heroes in this never-ending struggle for survival. It was a battlefront where a thousand men could die on an afternoon in a vain attempt to gain an area no bigger than a soccer field. It was also a battlefield where almost as many died from disease as from enemy bullets. Some reinforcements arrived from Britain early in the month, a happening which allowed some of the men to take leave. A long lull in the fighting gave one the impression that the British and French high commands on the one side and the German high command on the other were at a loss as to how to gain the initiative. And this was partly true. There was a German plan, though which certain officials reckoned would hasten the end of the war, but its implementation was a source of hot dispute before being passed for use. At that time there arrived in the British trenches a soldier, a small, bespectacled man of thirty, with a shy, retiring disposition. His name was Private Cyril Corby, who before being called up for military service had been a clerk in a coal yard. He first came to the notice of Sergeant George Brewer, on the day a frontal attack was made on three German machine gun posts. Many of his company were cut down by heavy fire. But before then, Cyril Corby was already running back, white and shaking with terror. Luckily for Corby, all the officers commanding his company were killed, and only Sergeant Brewer saw his act of cowardice. Sergeant. I saw what you did. I, I don't quite understand. You ran away, Corby. Halfway across, you turned your back and ran like a scalded cat. I was, I was frightened. The noise, the scream. Cowardice in the face of the enemy is a capital offence. At least when you go over the top, you have some chance. The fighting squad gives you none. Thank your lucky stars nobody else noticed what you did. As well as the fact that we had to withdraw. I might have been dead out there with all the others, sir. You're a soldier, Corby. That's what your king and country pay you for. Yes, Sergeant, but it's no good to me when I'm dead, is it? I hope you're not back-chatting me, because if you are, I'll break your scraggy neck. No, Sergeant, I was only trying to point out that... Shut up! I know what you mean. I've heard it all before. But you've got to think of the people back in Blighty. That's who you're fighting for. Do you want to see them dominated by a bunch of jerrys under Willie Kaiser, eh, do you? I, I never knew they wanted to. Well, they do, see. Anyway, the next time we go over the top, I'll be watching you close. And be thankful you're not on the other side. When they make a charge, the officers follow behind and shoot the first man they see what turns his back. You'd have been as dead as your mates now if you'd been a jerry. Look, I, I don't want to go over the top again, Sergeant. I, look, I just couldn't do it. You've got to. Time and time again, it's orders. And you'll get caught, marshaled and shot if you don't. Where's your courage, man? If all Englishmen were like you, the country would have been a Spanish, French or German colony by now. I even have to close my eyes when I fire a gun. I can't stand the bang. There followed another lull in the fighting. Two weeks passed without Corby's unit being called on to do anything more than man the muddy trenches. Corby made no secret of his fear, but of all the men in his company, only Private Eddie Watkins would bother to talk or sympathise with him. 
Brewer's got his eye on you, Cyril. You'd better watch it. <sighs> yes, I know. But there's nothing that I can do about it. He's given you just about every dirty job there is to do. He yeah, says it will harden me up. <laughs> Instead, it just makes me feel sick. I've been over the top six times, Cyril. Yes, I know. You told me. What I'm trying to say is, I'll look after you when we go next time. Look, there won't be a next time, Eddie. I won't go. You'll have to. The lads know all about you, and they, and they say they're going to push you to the front. They'll shoot you if you don't keep going on. Nobody will ask any questions after. And they'll have to shoot me. You're making it worse in your mind, thinking too much about it. You see, it'll be all right once we start out. Mind you, it's been quiet three days now, and not a shot from the Jerry Trenchers. It's like they're not there no more. I've told the Colonel what I think, and he's passed it on, Lieutenant Hawker. Well, I'd like to go and take a look for myself. I know you would. But have you thought that it might be a trap? Well, it's worth the risk. All I need is Sergeant Brewer and six men. Once you've passed our own barbed wire defences, there's 500 yards of open ground followed by three lines of German barbed wire fences to cross. And if those trenches happen to be manned, you'll be cut up like yesterday's mints. We could go at night. Cloudy, no moon. You'd be taking the gamble against enormous odds, Lieutenant. There's no logical reason in the world for the Germans to abandon their front-line trenches. It just wouldn't make sense. Now, this is the fifth day that no attempt has been made to return our small arms fire. Previous to that, there were constant sniping duels. Now, why is it stopped? Well, perhaps the enemy have had orders to conserve ammunition. Could be a dozen similar explanations. Well, I'd still like to go, sir. All right. All right, Lieutenant. I'll see if I can clear it with the Colonel. Just yourself, Brewer, and six men, you say? That's enough, sir. I don't think he'll make any objections. All right, all right. Stop chattering there now. You, Edison, shut up. <clears throat> There's a little job the lieutenant and me are doing tonight, and I want six men to come with us. I won't be asking for no volunteers, because I know you're all fed up and won't. Let me see now. Yes, you with a big mouth, Edison. Come and stand here with me. Sorry. And your pal Reed, he can come along too. Phillips, and Watkins... Ah, and Milligan, it's no good trying to make yourself look smaller. <laughs> ah, that leaves one more. Who'd enjoy the party most? Oh, yes, of course, little Cyril Corby. You can come and join our merry group. But, Sergeant... That's an order, Private Soldier Corby. Over here, at the double. I think this little sortie will do you more good than most, if you live through it. All right, you lot, report to the mess. I'll be there to brief you in five minutes. Do it, Eddie. Honest, I won't. Just the thought of it makes me feel quite... All right, all right. Shut up now while I do the talking. At midnight tonight, we're going over the top. Just the eight of us. There'll be no noise, no shouting, no shooting. Just fixed bayonets and creeping through the mud. Is that much clear? The lieutenant has reason to believe that Jerry's abandoned his front-line trenches and we're going over to take a gander. If they have, that's fine. If they ain't, we're in it, up to our eyeballs. Why would they give up their trenches, Sarge? Search me, son. But the fact is, they ain't done no shooting back at us for a couple of days, have they? Now then, if we get there and find no one, what we do is fire a flare and the rest of the lads will come across and occupy the trenches. If the jerrys are there, well, it's simply we scarber back here as quick as our legs can make it. You'll be cutting as little as possible and nothing that rattles. This is where we wait. The Sarge will be along in a tick. Shaking all over us, Eddie. Oh, you'll get over it. Once we're out, the old time will pass like magic. Don't have second thoughts, Cyril. You know what'll happen if you don't come with us. It's a few weeks extra life while waiting for the court-martial. And then six bullets from a firing squad. Oh, that's no way to go, Cyril. This way we've got a chance. Perhaps the lieutenant's right and the Jerry's have moved out. All here for the party, eh? Even you, eh, Corby? So you've decided to face it out after all, eh? Good. I don't like to court-martial someone. Too much paperwork to do. Anyway, I'll be right behind you, Private Corby, just in case you decide to change your mind. 
fact, I think I'm right in saying that we'll all be keeping an eye on you. All present, Sergeant. And correct, sir. Well, I trust the Sergeant's properly briefed you, men. I'll go over first. Sergeant, you take up the rear. Right up. Over we go, chaps. Bandits fixed, a small group of men picked their way through the mud and barbed wire towards the silent German trenches. On one occasion, when Cyril Corby tried to fall back in the darkness, one of his fellows pushed him on. It took half an hour to reach the German barbed wire defences and another 15 minutes for them to cut their way through. Then, cautiously, they approached the earthworks. So far, not a shot had been fired. They grouped together, now positive that the trenches were deserted, and Lieutenant Hawker led them down onto the wooden boards which formed the floor of the trench. It was dark and eerily quiet. Right, Harrison, Phillips, Milligan, you go along that way. Be as quiet as you can, report back along here if you see something of interest. Sergeant? Uh, you, Watkins, and Corby, come with me. There should be some kind of a command post somewhere along here. About 50 yards along the trench, the lieutenant stopped before a short flight of crudely made steps which led down to a closed wooden door. Either side of me, you fire at any living thing inside. You ready? Yes, sir. Hey, it's all right, chaps. Place is empty. All right, close the door behind you, Corby. Light those two oil lamps siding, will you? Ah, oh, well, well, well. You see the mystery, isn't it? A line of perfectly good trenches and not a soul manning them. Now, I wonder why. Strategic withdrawal, perhaps, sir. Oh, I find that hard to believe, Sergeant. Jerry won't give a foot of ground without losing a thousand men for it. Ah, oh, there's some other reason. Watch these under the tarpaulin, sir. Hmm? Shells? No. Cylinders. They got all German writing over them, sir. Can you read German, sir? No, I can't, Sergeant, unfortunately. Huh. Well, we're going to have a job finding someone who can, unless we can catch a prisoner who speaks English. Excuse me, sir. I, I, I can speak German, sir. Can you, Corby? Well, that's a useful achievement in this war. All right, then take a look at this. What does all this jumble mean? It's um, a kind of gas, sir. No, it's just for heating, lighting, I suppose. It's called mustard gas, sir. Uh -huh. To be handled with great care and only in the presence of a senior officer. So, they are going to use it. Now, rumours have been rife that the Germans intend to use gas, and this is it. It's nasty stuff, too. It burns the skin off your body, so I'm told. Well, it says here that before releasing, it must be ensured that there is a breeze blowing directly towards the enemy line, sir. Well, that makes sense. Hmm. I wonder why it's been left here, like this. Thirty cylinders there are, sir. Watkins, wait outside. Keep an eye open for the others coming back, will you? Yes, sir. Make I make a suggestion, sir. Go right ahead, Corby. You're welcome. The Germans aren't likely to have their front-line trenches manned if they're ready to release this gas, sir. Wouldn't it be more likely that they've left here not just enough men to do the job? That's good thinking, Corby. Yeah, but if that's so, where are these men? Well, somewhere close by, sir, I'll bet. Well, why leave this stuff unguarded? That's damn careless of them. At a guess, I'd say that they intend to release this gas at the first sign of an easterly breeze. Tonight or tomorrow, if the conditions are right, sir. There's a westerly blow at the moment, sir. Well, it doesn't answer the question of why it's been left unguarded like this, does it? Well, say six to ten men to release the gas, and possibly half a dozen similar dugouts, sir. They could be working together at some point along this trench. The cylinders are heavy and would have to be taken out one at a time and... Placed on top of the earthworks. He could be right, sir. Hmm. They back, sir. Huh? They say there's a group of men working on something about 200 yards down the line, sir. How many are there? Eight, sir. Well, that's how many they've seen, anyways. All right. Now, keep it quiet. Get your bayonet. Take one of them prisoner, but only if it's feasible. All right, come on. We'll take them from both sides at once.
Lieutenant Hawker separated his small group and attacked the toiling men at the soft note from his whistle. It was quick, silent and deadly. In a few seconds, the Germans lay dead and Watkins was the only British casualty having cut his thumb on the German belt buckle. Well, that's that. Pity we didn't have the chance to take a prisoner. Corby could have asked him a few leading questions. <laughs> Still, it's pretty obvious what they were up to, lining the trenches with gas cylinders. One of these jellies was an officer, sir. Good. Well, search his clothing, see if he's carrying any orders. Corby, look over anything of interest, will you? There's a good chap. Shall I fire the very pistol and bring the lads over, sir? Well, now, that's something of a poser, Sergeant. Just hold it. It's difficult to say where the concentrations of German troops are. If you've been using your eyes, you'll have noticed that this line of trenches is linked with those in the rear. Our chaps could be overwhelmed by a strong counterattack. No. I think we'd better find out more before we bring him over here. It's darker than Satan's eyeball, sir. We'll need some daylight to find out how the jellies are placed. Yeah, exactly. In fact, our own position could be precarious. These men we've killed could be getting relieved, which means we can expect trouble shortly. And that, in turn, could lead to an alarm being given along the whole German line. Yes, Sergeant. I think we'd better do it hush-hush and just hope for the best. You got anything of interest there, Corby? Oh, only his identity documents, sir. Oberleutnant Hermann Busser. Hmm. Oh, where have you been to, Watkins? Just wanted to see how many of them cylinders they took out, sir. Uh, more than 50 there is, sir. Well, it's a lot, but it's not enough for what they were obviously planning. What we're killing this work party, I don't think they'll have a chance to use this stuff tomorrow. If conditions are right, High Command will no doubt launch an attack tomorrow to prevent its use. All right. There's nothing much more we can do here. Somebody's coming, sir. Damn it all. All right, we'll have to take him on and hope for the best. Now, no shooting unless necessary. Milligan, Phillips, Watkins, get over there and wait till you hear my signal. If we're heavily outnumbered and you hear me blow twice, make your own way back across no man's land. Right, we'll climb over here. Where's Corby? He was here a second ago, sir. Blast that man. Peter's done a bunk. I should have kept an eye on him. All right, never mind, Sergeant. Come on, follow me. All the waiting soldiers could see and hear of the approaching enemy was a dim, shaded light and the guttural murmur of voices. When close enough, Lieutenant Hawker raised the whistle to his lips. The Germans had been walking two abreast up the length of the trench and the British had to fire almost blindly. Their enemy reacted quickly and returned the fire as they scattered up the inclines on either side of the trench. It was then that Lieutenant Hawker realised how many men there were. Certainly no less than 30. He blew his whistle again. The British soldiers quickly broke off the engagement and withdrew as best they could. Knowing they'd be trying to make their way back to their own lines, the Germans lined their trench and kept up a fusillade of rifle fire over an arc of 120 degrees. Private Watkins was killed instantly as he tried to get through the barbed wire. And another of his companions, Private Phillips, caught a bullet in the leg on the far side of the wire. He sank down to the mud, but later succeeded in crawling to his own lines before daylight turned him into a helpless target. Of Private Corby, nothing was seen. Once safe, Sergeant Brewer waxed brutally eloquent on what he'd do to the little man if he'd survived the engagement. I'll turn him inside out and spill the blighter's guts all along the front line. Just when we needed him most, he does a bunk. Ha! Talks German, does he, eh? Wouldn't surprise me none if he hasn't been secretly on their bleeding side all along, the little swine. Probably over there now, swigging schnapps and eating their stinking black bread. All right, Sergeant. You let off steam. Calm down. Well, I'll have to report his desertion, of course. It'll be a court-martial if he does come back. He'll be made an example of as a warning to others like him. The army can't afford cowards in its ranks. I'm off to see the colonel. I suggest you get some sleep. It's possible we might be making a frontal assault during the day in view of my report. <laughs> You! Why, you measly little rat! What are you doing in there? I, I, I was waiting for you, Sergeant. I, I wanted to tell you that... Shut I... up! Do you know what I'm going to do with you, eh? I'm going to break every bone in your miserable yellow body. 
While your mates are getting shot down, what are you doing, eh? Crawling like a pig across no man's land. Sergeant, you ain't going to get away with it, Corby, I swear it. The lieutenant's reporting what you did. But you're going to be in no physical condition to attend a court-martial for some time to come. Please, Sergeant, There's please nothing explain. to explain. Yellow-bellied rats don't have to explain. Their actions speak for themselves. Sergeant, I want to tell you that I was... Shut up! I'll break every bone in your body twice. You've got a choice, Corby. Put up your hands to defend yourself or stand there and get broken peacefully. what I'm giving him, sir. Yes, I dare say, but there are official ways of dealing with this man's behavior. I thought you were merely giving way to fancy when you said you were going to hurt him. You realize what this could mean, don't you? I don't care, sir. All right, I'll overlook what I saw when I came in, but by doing that, I'll also have to see what I can do to help Corby out of his mess. You mean let the little rat get away with it? No, not necessarily, Sergeant. What I came to see you about was a report I've just received from the Colonel. We can't yet identify the cause, but apparently there's pandemonium all along the length of the German lines. Lights have been seen, a lot of shouting heard. Oh, as far as ten miles north of here. It's most odd and it's quite inexplicable. Maybe they pull in out, sir. There's not much reason for them to do that, is there, sir? Even if it were true, why'd they make such a ruddy, awful noise about it? Well, they're foreigners, sir, and you know yourself there's no accounting for the things they get up to. If I, I, I might say something... Shut up, Corby. Nobody wants to hear from a little squirt like you. That's a bit harsh, Sergeant. We can't be arrogant and pig-headed like those Jerry's over there, now can we? Just let the little fella talk. After what he done, letting the side down and all. Well, he helped with the German translation. It was pretty useful. Right, Corby, what did you want to say? Well, I just wanted to mention the gas, sir. Yeah, what about it? It explains the panic over there, sir. Oh, <laughs> I see. Hardly, though. I mean, it's quite safe inside those steel cylinders. You saw that for yourself, didn't you? Well, the sergeant didn't give me a chance to explain my absence when we fell back, sir. I went back along the trench and read in full the instructions for its use. I released as many as I could before I made my way back here, sir. You did what, Corby? Damn it, or man, are you serious? Well, you said that there was a westerly wind blowing, so I thought it might be a good idea to let them have a dose of their own medicine, sir. <laughs> How many did you release? Something between 60 and 70 cylinders. As many as that? But why didn't you tell me what your intentions were while we were over there? Well, sir, I, I was too scared to. Scared? In case you said no, sir. He was scared. Would you believe that, Sergeant? Oh, I'm flabbergasted, sir. The juries must be running eastwards like bunnies <laughs> with their tails on fire. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Corby? Uh, will I still get it in the neck, sir? <laughs> in the neck, Corby? Of course not. <laughs> we pin medals on a man's chest, not on his neck. You come along with me. We'd all better pay a visit to the command post. <laughs> High Adventure is produced by Henry Duffenthal.